Hey folks, thanks for clicking on this video. If you're here, you probably have some type of general interest in this pull type grader box, or you're just a dedicated subscriber to Dig Drive DIY. Either way, the point of this video is to talk about the materials that you would need if you wanted to build a grader box like this from scratch. Now there's three reasons I've been wanting to make this video. Number one is I've had a recent increase in the interest of videos that I have on my YouTube channel pertaining to this grader box. The second reason is that we used to build and sell these grader boxes. We shipped them all over the Midwest. It was time consuming and we didn't make a lot of money at it, so we decided to give it up. But I've recently had a lot of people asking me if they can purchase one, and if not, could I provide the dimensions and basically the blueprint on how to make them. So the third reason is that I think these are a terrific tool. Any person that has the slightest interest in wanting to build one should be able to find the resources to do so. Now I don't know where to post or make available a blueprint for these grader boxes, but I do have a YouTube channel and so that led me to the idea behind this video. So I'm going to try to provide all the dimensions and a material list of sorts for everything you would need to build one of these the way we built them. Now mine is one of the oldest ones we built, so some of the components that we put on the newer ones is a little bit different, and there's a few variations. I'll talk about that later. All the different parts that I talk about, I'm gonna put in the description down below so that you can hopefully click on links to the various components. And if you happen to find this video helpful, that'll help me out a lot. All right, to get started on your grader box, you're gonna to want to begin with a cutting edge and the back plate. The cutting edge I got from Rural King. It's a 60 inch cutting edge and the back plate should be made in such a way that it is just slightly longer than the cutting edge. So a 60 inch cutting edge, you're gonna cut the back plate at about 16 and a quarter inches. The back plate is 11 inches tall, then by 16 and a quarter long. Now on our back plates, this one is fairly straight, but we had a slight bend right here to accommodate a little bit of a pitch on that cutting edge when you mount it up. If you don't do the bend, you could just mount a half inch bar across the bottom and let the bottom of the cutting edge sit against the bar and then drill the holes into your backing plate and mount it so that it's angled forward ever so slightly. All the square tubing on here is two inch by two inch and it's eighth inch wall. I would then start with this top two inch piece, which is again gonna be 60 and a quarter inches long. That's welded right to the top of your backing plate. The tongue welds to the front of that top plate and it goes the full length to the front. So the tongue is 46 inches long, not counting the hitch plates. The hitch plates themselves are three and a half inches by three eighths inch plate. You, there's a number of different ways you could do this. You don't have to have it all flush mounted like mine is. You could just weld them across the top if you'd like. Also on my tongue it goes straight through and there's no disconnect. On some of the newer grader boxes that we were building we were making a, a plate here with four bolts in it and you could disconnect the tongue from the body of the grader box. We did that for shipping purposes and plus for overwinter storage you can take the tongue off and it occupies a lot less space. Alright so once you got your back member and your tongue done you've got these two front members are going to be 29 and an eighth inches long there's two of them obviously and then finally you're going to weld your end caps on the end 14 inches wide by 11 and a half inches tall now some of that is going to vary on your end cap height because with this cutting edge mine was an old cutting edge that i found at a junkyard if you buy a new cutting edge from say rural king then that new cutting edge is going to be slightly taller what you want to do is you want to leave the cutting edge hang down, I would say a half an inch below your side plate right here, and that will allow it to have some wear before the edges dig. All right, next we've got a gusset that's underneath the tongue right here. The gusset is a triangle that's seven and a half inches tall and four and a half inches deep. This just provides some extra support for the backing plate and connects it directly to the tongue. Okay, we're gonna move on to our cylinder upright right here. The cylinder upright is eight and three quarter inches tall, and it's again out of that two inch by two inch tubing. All right, the mounting plates for my cylinder are our three eighths inch plate, two inches by five and a half. Then we've got a hole drilled into them, one inch in from the end. All right, we're gonna move on to our axle tubing. We're gonna start out with this tubing right here. The rear axle main tube is an inch and five eighths OD, and it's 58 inches long. The wheel arms are two inch tubing by 15 inches long, and they've got a radius cut on the end so that we can mount it up to that tubing. And then our axle shaft is a three quarter inch by eight inch long piece. The 
axle shaft again is three quarter inch rod. It's eight inches long. We've drilled a hole one and a quarter inches in from the end to drill our three quarter inch hole to mount our axle shaft. The wheels that I've used is a 15 inch Arnold wheel available at Home Depot and lots of other places for usually 35 to 40 dollars each and they come with a plastic insert for the axle shaft that has a little grease zerk on it. They're a pretty decent little wheel and we used a ton of them and haven't had any issues with them so that's the wheel we used on these and if you use that with the three quarter inch plastic insert then you're going to want to weld a washer on your three quarter inch axle shaft and then you're going to want to drill a hole in the end about three sixteenths of an inch in so that you got room to put the wheel on then a washer then your cotter pin so i'm going to call this the axle sleeve this is what the axle turns inside the axle sleeve is made out of inch and seven eighths od and it's got an inch and five eighths id obviously you want the main axle tube to go inside this axle sleeve the axle sleeve is two and a half inches long We've got some three inch washers here with an inch and five eighths hole in them. The washers need to be slid onto the axle prior to welding so that you can put them up against the axle sleeve and then weld them last. The axle sleeve is gonna stick out about an inch and a quarter to the inside. And you can see we've got a three eighths inch nipple here with a grease zerk on it. The axle mounts themselves are half inch plate and those are three inches by five inches. All right, we're gonna move on to the cylinder connecting arm. Mine right here, as you see, it has an inch and a half by inch and a half inch tubing, but we eventually switched to using a half inch thick metal plate. And then we actually tapered it so that it was n a bit narrower here and then got fatter as it connected to the axle tubing. Actually, in the newer grader boxes, we had a half inch mounting bracket up here as well. We took a half inch plate and just connected it to the center and a half inch plate here that connected to the rotating arm. Your cylinder connecting arm should be an overall length of eight inches with the hole seven inches from where it connects to the main axle tube. Now this is going to vary depending on what cylinder you use or if you use an electric actuator and we can talk about that a little bit more here at length. What I want to point out is, is that you shouldn't determine where this is mounted on the axle tube until you have your wheels mounted and you have your main axle connected to the grader box. And then you're going to mount your cylinder and make sure that when the wheels are touching the ground that you still have a little bit of travel in your cylinder so that you can lift the wheels farther off the ground. In this instance, I've got an inch and a half of stroke left in that cylinder so that I can raise the wheels up off the ground. And that helps it to dig in and bite and go over some irregular ground surfaces. All right, the next thing to talk about is the rippers. Now these rippers I got from Agra Supply and they were longer. They were actually taller rippers. I had to cut them down and drill new holes in them to work. The rippers are a great, great feature. I use them all the time, but they are a pain in the butt to build because you have to cut those off. You have to drill new holes. And what I've done is I drilled four holes in each ripper tooth. This hole is for transport. It raises it all the way up. The next hole is to put the ripper tooth exactly level with the cutting edge so that it just scratches the surface. This hole puts it one inch below the cutting edge and finally this hole is two inches below the cutting edge. The ripper teeth need to be cut off because at full length the grater box doesn't raise up high enough for you to get them in and out. All right finally we're going to talk about the hydraulics a little bit. I've chosen to use a hydraulic cylinder because it works much faster than the electric actuator but the electric actuator is a great solution for those vehicles that don't have any onboard hydraulics. We've pulled these grater boxes with four wheelers, UTVs, even had a guy using a golf cart to pull it. And in those instances, the electric actuator is a good choice. Now with the electric actuator, you're gonna need a switch box. I sourced a two position sealed momentary switch from Gamma Electronics, and it worked really nicely. You have to wire it up so that you have two clips that connect to the battery, and then they go into your switch box, and then two wires coming out of the switch box back to the electric actuator, but it works great. And it's a great solution if you don't have onboard hydraulics. Now, if you do have hydraulics, and let's say you have, for example, a little John Deere garden tractor like this one. I did the down and dirty, quick and easy hydraulic install on this one. On these tractors, if you have hydraulics on the side, then that means you have hydraulic outlets on the front. This tractor only has one set of remotes. Some of the 318s, 322, 332, 420s, they all have dual hydraulic outlets on the front. And you could even make them better than this. You could make 90s so that they're closer to the tractor and tight. But basically, 
I went to my local hydraulic shop. I had a set of hoses made that connect into the front ports, routed them up underneath the tractor, and then back to the back and mounted them on a, a little mounting plate there. And so that's how I run my hydraulics. Now I have also done a couple tractors where I teed into the hydraulic spool itself, which means you've got to go up underneath the tractor and actually disconnect and tee in line with the hydraulic system. And that's a little bit cleaner install, but if you want to get working quickly, this is the way to go. Just tee into the front hydraulics. Okay, did I miss anything? I just got done watching the video and there were a few things I missed. Namely, the one thing that I didn't talk about was steel. Now, if you're watching this in hopes of doing it yourself, I would assume you have some level of fabrication skills and that you've purchased raw steel before. Every town has its own place to go buy steel, but more of a national chain would be like a metal supermarkets and they can cut steel to order. So they're a great resource to use. We have one here locally and I can call them up with a bunch of steel measurements and sizes and I'll have it all ready to go when I get there. The second thing I noticed in this video was a couple of the measurements were off. I said one thing and wrote down another. For the most part what I said was correct. The point of this video was to give more of a detailed look at this and an overall plan for how you would go about it and more importantly where to find the components of the different parts that make up these greater boxes. The third thing I wanted to say more about was hydraulic versus electric. If your tractor has hydraulics, if it's got a loader or it's got remote hydraulics on the front, in my opinion, that's the easiest way to use these grader boxes because it's way more responsive and you have more of a feel in the valve. The electric actuator is a great solution and it's a great fit for vehicles that don't have onboard hydraulics, but it's a little bit slower. And if you want to do a lot of filling and cutting and up and down of the grader box, then hydraulics the only way to go. And I didn't mention it too much when I was speaking in the video, but the hydraulic cylinder, I've got a link to one in the description. This particular cylinder has a length of only 13 inches when it's retracted from pin to pin, and it's only got a six inch stroke. So it's a small cylinder. They're about 50 bucks, I think, on eBay. And lastly, I didn't talk about price. There's too many variations in price to really give you a solid number on what I think this should cost you to build. It's gonna be upwards of $500 or more. It's gonna be more like $600. I wouldn't be surprised if you have $700 in one of these. I did wanna mention that there are other manufacturers out there. We're not building these greeter boxes anymore to sell, but I found a few on eBay. If you look around on the web, if you search pull type greeter boxes, you'll be able to find them. And there looks like some pretty good ones out there. Let me know in the comments down below if you found this video helpful and good luck with your project. Hope you're grading soon. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. Take care.